Thank you for joining me for this week's Sunday School lesson, where in our Sunday School lesson this week, we're going to be taking a look at the healing touch of Jesus. We're going to be taking a look at how one can be healed by Jesus, what it takes for one to be healed by Jesus. Our Sunday School lesson this week is going to take a look at Jesus interacting with a completely different crowd of people in comparison to our Sunday School lesson last week, where in our Sunday School lesson last week, we saw where Jesus he proclaimed himself to be the light of the world. And the Jews who heard Jesus say that if you live by the truth, his truth, that it could set you free, there was a group of Jews that they neglected that, they disregarded that, they did not believe that Jesus could set them free. In fact, they didn't think that they needed to be set free. And so they spoke against Jesus, who eventually told them that his father was the one that they said was their God. And when Jesus said that, they picked up stones. They were ready to stone Jesus to death because they believed that Jesus was blaspheming. Their heart was against Christ. But here in the eighth chapter of Luke's gospel, we'll see there in the 40th verse as our lesson opens up today, we'll see that Jesus was returning to Galilee. He was making a return to Galilee from having healed someone, healing a man who was possessed by many demons. And upon his return there, We'll see in that 40th verse that Jesus, he was welcomed back. There was a multitude that was waiting for Jesus. And we're told that that multitude, that they welcomed him back. Now in the 41st verse there, within that multitude, within that crowd of people that were welcoming Jesus back, we'll see that there was a man who was named Jairus there. Scripture tells us this man was a ruler of the synagogue. So Jairus, he was the rabbi. He was like the pastor. He was the leader of that synagogue. And so we're told there in that 41st verse, we'll see that, that Jairus, he was desperate. He was desperate for Jesus's help as he fell down to Jesus's feet, begging for him to come to his house. Why did Jairus want Jesus to come to his house? Where we're told there in the 42nd verse, that he wanted Jesus to come to his house because his 12 year old daughter, she was sick. She was dying. We're told there in that verse. Now, what I love about this verse and, and what I love about uh, this, this recording of Jesus in scripture is that when this man came to Jesus for help, when he fell down to Jesus, begging for Jesus to help him, we don't see a response from Jesus where he is questioning uh, this man, he's not trying to push this man to the side. We see that Jesus, he is attentive to this man. And in fact, we'll see that in that 42nd verse that, that Jesus, he doesn't delay. We're told that Jesus, that he simply moved. What, what I love about this verse is that this is how the Lord responds to us when, when we come to the Lord, when, when we pray out, when we cry out to the Lord. The Lord, even though we may not recognize it, the Lord, he immediately moves on our behalf. And when I say that the Lord moves on our behalf, when God moves for you, I want you to understand that he is always moving to your benefit. He's always moving to uplift you. When you cry out to the Lord, especially when you are desperate for the Lord, God, he is going to help his children. He's going to help all of us who are of sincere faith. So again, we see there in that 42nd verse that, that Jesus, he moved, he moved forward towards Jairus's house. And we're told there that there was a multitude of people that moved with Jesus. In fact, we're told that the multitude that they pressed against Jesus. Now within that multitude, we see another person who is desperate for, for Jesus to help them. We are told that there was a woman that was there who had a flow of blood. We, we often talk about the woman that had an issue of blood. She, she had an hemorrhaging issue and we're told that she had this issue for 12 years of her life. And we're told that in that verse that over those years, she has spent all of her money visiting physicians, visiting doctors who were unable to help her. They were unable to help her solve her problem. They were unable to help her solve the problem that she had with hemorrhaging. And so this woman, like Jairus, she is desperate for help. And some of us would say that both this woman and Jairus, that, that they are using Jesus as a last ditch effort. And and so some of us, we may try to use this against them, 
that they are using Jesus as their last ditch effort. I wouldn't use this against them. And the reason why I would not use them this against them is because they realized the one who could help them. They didn't keep trying to go at things without turning to the Lord. Something that so many of us do today, and again, I preached about this recently in my sermon, is that so many of us, we can recognize that we need the Lord, but we won't turn to him. And the reason why we won't turn to him is because we are so prideful. We are filled with ego. And, and some of us, we, we don't think that we need God. We think that God needs us, but in actuality, we need the Lord in this life. And so I won't hold it against Jairus. I won't hold it against this woman here because they realized that they needed the Lord and they turned to the Lord. So how could I hold it against them from, for, for turning to the Lord who they believe could help them? I can't hold that against them. I can't hold that against anyone. In fact, I would encourage all people to come to the realization that you need the Lord in your life. You can't go wrong with knowing that. So we'll see there in the 44th verse that the woman, she came behind Jesus. Scripture tells us there and she touched the border of his garment. I, I, I really want to harp on that for a moment. She touched on the border of his garment. She didn't lay a hand on him. She didn't grab him physically. She merely laid a hand on the edge of his clothes. And, and we're told there in that 44th verse that when she did that, she was immediately healed. Now in the 45th verse, we'll see there that in the midst of the pressing crowd that was pressing up against him, Jesus said, he asked, who touched me? Who, who grabbed me? Who, who touched me? To which Peter, I imagine that Peter looked at Jesus like Jesus was crazy. You know, Peter, he said there, hey, everybody is touching you. You're in the midst of a crowd, is what Peter said to Jesus. And, and in the 46th verse, I imagine that as Peter was looking at Jesus like he was crazy, Jesus looked at him and was like, yeah, I know I'm in the midst of, of the crowd, but someone, someone touched me. Jesus says there in the 46th verse, he said that someone touched me for I perceive power going out from me. Now, is Jesus, is he like some kind of battery? Is he like, is he like someone who we could look at a chart and see that he's at 100% power? And, and when someone grab him, that his power, that it comes down little by little by little. Is that, is that how Jesus worked? No, that's, that's not how, that's not how it worked. I, I, I chuckle at that thought, but, but something that I do want to point out here with this multitude pressing against Jesus there uh, in that verse there is that he was so, he was surrounded by so many people, but it was just one person who Jesus could feel, you know, grab at him, who Jesus could feel his power going out to. Again, he, the scripture says he was thrown about, a crowd was pressing up against him. And so you would think that if all it took was for one to lay their hands on Jesus in order to be healed, then you would think that everybody in the crowd was being healed, but not everyone who was touching on Jesus was being healed. Only one person there was, was healed. I think that that is something to think about because so many people, uh, they, they are all about the laying on of hands. They believe that, that if, for example, a pastor, they believe if a pastor lay their hands on them, that the touch of the pastor, that, that it can heal them. They believe that the touch of the pastor, that it can bless them. But here we see in scripture where Jesus, he was pressed about by a multitude, but it's one person who Jesus says, they touch me and I can feel power going out from me. And again, we saw in scripture where the woman was immediately healed. So why was this woman healed? I imagine that all of those that were around Jesus, I imagine that all of them were there to have Jesus lay, to lay his hands on them because they, like many today, believe that, hey, if Jesus simply lay his hands on me, I can be healed. I can be blessed. Why did it not happen for the rest? Why did it happen for, for one? We'll see there in the 47 verse that the woman, she came forward. We see that she's trembling there. We are told there in the 47 verse. I, I don't believe that the woman was afraid of Jesus because Jesus hey, asked, who, who is it that touched me? I don't think that Jesus was asking in that manner. 
but I believe the woman was trembling because for, for 12 years of her life, she had been, been dealing with this, this, this issue of blood. Take it from someone who went through dialysis for five years. When I got the phone call for, for my transplant, I was a bit shaking myself because I was in, I was in disbelief. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that that it had finally happened. I couldn't imagine how it would feel after going a dozen years and, and finally receiving that call. I know that that many transplant patients have gone far longer, far longer than I did. And so this woman, she had an issue of blood, again, we're told for a dozen years, for, for 12 years. And all it took for her was to, to grab the border of Jesus' clothes and she was immediately healed. So I, I believe that this woman, I believe that she was in, in a frame of mind of, I can't believe it. It actually happened. You know, I think that she was in, in that frame of mind. And so we see that she comes forward there in the 47th verse. She falls before Jesus and she said that she was the one that had touched him. And she said again, in this crowd and to Jesus that again included the disciples as well. We know that Peter was there. They are able to hear that she was healed by, by merely touching Jesus. Now, was it just her touch that healed Jesus? Because again, like I said, there were many that was there that were probably laying their hands on Jesus that could hear the woman say this. And they probably said to themselves, well, I touched Jesus. I haven't been healed. And they may have began to wonder, well, why wasn't I healed? So what was it about her that she could reach out, grab the border of Jesus clothes and be healed? Why was she healed? We're told there in the 48 verse that Jesus said to her daughter, be of good cheer, your faith. Jesus says there, your faith has made you well. So what was it that had healed her? Scripture tells us there that it was her faith. Jesus tells us there that it was her faith that had healed her. There are many people that come to God today. They will cry out. They will pray to the Lord today. They will pray for God to heal them and they will feel that they haven't been healed. There are many today who will say, I, I have prayed, I've prayed my prayers, but prayer doesn't work. I have had many people tell me that prayer doesn't work. When I can tell them, no, prayer does work. It works for me. So what's the difference between me and them? What was the difference between the woman and the multitude of those who may have been pressing against Jesus, but could not be healed? Faith. And I want you to understand today, and I've said this before, I've said this several times. If you pray a prayer and there is no faith in your prayer, you doubt the Lord, God is not going to move for you. That's in James. James said that as well. God will answer the prayers of faith. And so some of us will say, well, you're saying that God doesn't answer the prayer of sinners. The Lord doesn't hear sinners' prayers. The Lord will hear a sinner's prayer if that sinner has repented. If that sinner has repented in their heart, if that sinner desires in their heart to talk to God, if they are open to the Lord, God will hear their prayers. He heard all of our prayers when we were sinners. When we were ready to get out of sin, the Lord, his ears perked up and he was attentive to our prayers and he moved on our behalf. That is the reason why Jesus gave himself for us so that we as sinners can have an opportunity to go before the Lord in our prayers. But again, listen closely to me today. If you aren't asking out of faith, God is not going to move for you. God will give you the desires of your heart. As I said in the 15th chapter of John's gospel in eighth verse, he will give you those desires if your prayers are of faith and if it will glorify the Lord. That is something that you must know and understand today. Now, we'll see that in the 49th verse there as we continue on here in our lesson. We'll see that while Jesus was speaking with the woman, someone came from Jairus' house. We have to remember that Jairus was still there. He was trying to get Jesus to get to his house, but you can only imagine, you know, Jesus had to stop 
for a moment there as he was going to the house. But we'll see that someone came from his house and they said to Jairus that his daughter had died. And they said to Jairus, don't trouble the teacher. Don't, don't trouble him any longer. You know, because again, his daughter had died. Now in the 50th verse, we'll see that, that Jesus was, was able to overhear what was said to Jairus. And Jesus, he spoke to Jairus. He said to him, don't be afraid. Only believe, Jesus said there. And he said, she, your daughter, will be made well. Something that I want you to pay close attention to here is the authority for which Jesus is speaking with. He spoke with authority in our Sunday school lesson last week, but the Jews that was in that crowd, they disregarded the authority that Jesus spoke with. But here again today, we see where Jesus, he is speaking with authority. There is no hesitation. There is no guessing on his part. We're told there in the 51st verse that when Jesus, when they all entered into Jairus's house, Jesus, he only allowed Jairus, his, his wife, the mother of the daughter, Peter, James, and John, he only allowed them to enter into the home. And that was done for a specific purpose that was done for a specific reason, which we'll see begins there in the 52nd verse, where in the 52nd verse, Jesus, he said to, to imagine the father and the mother there, he said, do not weep. She is not dead, but sleeping. And those who, who may have been in the house at one point in time there in the 53rd verse, we're told that they ridiculed Jesus. They laughed at the thought that, that the daughter wasn't dead, that she was only sleeping. They knew that she was dead. So what I'm going to say about that in this moment here with this miracle is that this, this girl, the daughter was in the dead. I do believe that this multitude, the people that ha may have been in the house when, when Jesus and Jairus and, and the mother and Peter, James and John, when they entered in, I do believe that they heard Jesus as they was walking in. I believe they heard Jesus say, now, don't worry. She isn't dead that, that she is sleeping. And I imagine that they chuckled at the thought they, they, you know, and, and, and they weren't doing it in, in a jokingly manner. They were doing it in disbelief because I believe that they were able to check her pulse and that there was no pulse. I do believe that the daughter indeed was dead, but this goes to show us that Jesus, he views death in a totally different manner than, than we do. Jesus, yes, our bodies die physically, but Jesus again is always concerned with the soul. And so Jesus, he looked at the soul and said, that soul is not dead, it's sleeping. It is merely resting. And so he was saying to Jairus, Again, don't disregard their laughter, disregard it. He was telling the mother there, only believe. And so we see why Jesus emptied out the house and only allowed a few there because, because those who were initially in the house, they doubted, they were of unbelief. And Jesus, he desired for faith. He desired for faith to be in that house. So we'll see that in the 54th verse that Jesus, he then took the girl by the hand and he called to her saying, little girl arise. This is very similar to Lazarus, right? In fact, if you think about it for a moment, if you take a look at scripture, when Jesus spoke about the death of Lazarus, he also described Lazarus as, as only being asleep. And so when he got to the tomb of Lazarus, he called Lazarus forth, just as he did here with the little girl, where he said to the little girl, arise. He called for Lazarus to arise, to to come forth. And so we'll see there in the 55th, the 55th verse there that when Jesus had called for the girl to arise, her spirit, we're told, returned and she arose immediately. The 56th verse tells us that her parents, they were astonished. So something that I want us to take away from our Sunday school lesson this week again is faith. It is not simply about Jesus laying hands on you. It's not simply about going out and touching Jesus. His healing touch all is all about your faith. It is all about your faith. Your faith will make you well. You have to believe in his authority. You have to believe in his power. If you don't have faith, you will not be made well. You will not be made whole in your soul. So again, think about what Jesus said to Nicodemus in the third chapter of John's gospel and the 16th verse. 
the promise of everlasting life, the promise of being made whole in your soul. It is all about believing. It is all about having faith. When you have faith, as you have heard me say before, you are powerful. Don't underestimate how powerful you are. That is a problem that we have today. Many believers, they underestimate their power. Whereas Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul said it for himself. You can say it for yourself as well. I say it for myself as well already today because I know what my faith in the Lord, I know what it can do for me. And I encourage you to have faith in what God can do for you because I know what the Lord can do for you if you believe. Thanks for watching this week's Sunday School lesson. As always, I hope that you enjoyed this lesson. I hope that you will take something away from this lesson, that you will apply it to yourself and that you will share it with someone somewhere. And I hope that you'll come back for our Sunday School lesson next week. Make sure that you're following this channel so that you can get the next notification for next week's Sunday School lesson so that you don't miss it, so that you don't miss the Sunday School lesson, the sermons, the Bible studies, or the Food for Thoughts. Make sure that you're following this channel today.